Hey everyone, welcome to Bite Size Edu. I'm Presley, and today I'm going to be talking about NASA's Osiris Rex mission. If you don't know what that is, it's a really, really cool mission that is going to be launching later this year, and it's going to go all the way up into space, and it's going to go to this asteroid called Bennu, and it's going to orbit Bennu, and then it's actually going to send out a little arm, and it's going to touch Bennu, it's going to get a sample from Bennu's surface, and it's going to collect a lot of the material from its surface, and it's going to put that in a return pod, and then about eight years later, after mapping the surface and doing all sorts of really cool stuff there, the return capsule is going to come rocketing into a desert in Utah and then they're going to collect a sample and be able to research that to learn a lot about what happened when our solar system was created. That is absolutely amazing that that's actually going to happen and start later this year. I was lucky enough to be invited to a NASA social event over on Lockheed Martin where I got to learn a lot about the mission as well as the people behind it. I was really excited to be able to go out there and learn so much and I want to share what I learned with you guys. We started off the day by listening to some really cool presentations that the people behind the mission did. They were really, really interesting, and it was great to learn about what it was like to actually work on a mission. The first one was by Dante Loretta, who was basically the Alan Stern of this mission. If you haven't seen my interview with Alan Stern that I did last year on my other channel, there'll be a link in the description to where you can check that out. Anyway, he heads the mission, and he kind of tells everyone what to do, and I just can't believe that someone is so experienced and so wise to be able to lead an entire mission that's going all the way up into space to touch an asteroid. So OSIRIS-REx is an asteroid sample return mission, and the mission basically comes down to the sequence that you see playing out over here on the movie on the right, where we're going to get the spacecraft essentially hovering over a, a location on the asteroid surface and then send it down at a very slow and gentle 10 centimeters per second to make a five second contact with the asteroid surface and essentially vacuum up the regolith that's there on the surface. Regolith is the term we use to describe loose soil and rocky material on the surface of an airless body. So we'll talk about lunar regolith or asteroidal regolith. So we're really going back four and a half billion years in history and we're getting rocks that record the processes that were taking place right at the dawn of our solar system when the planets were being born and the materials that would go into those planets were being formed. Then we got to listen to one by the head of the engineering and it was really interesting to hear about the engineering team and the science team had, like, didn't really fight that much but they kind of talked about how the engineering and science team bickered because the science team wanted to do a lot with the asteroid, they wanted to do a lot with the samples, they wanted to learn so much by this one asteroid, but the engineering team couldn't get as much as the science team wanted done so they basically fought a lot about um, what the engineering team could do versus what the science team wanted. This is actually the sample head, right? So this is where the sample's gonna reside. Um, and it's about the size of a GTO air filter, so they don't make them anymore. Then the science team also did a presentation. Again, the only way to really get a real understanding of what actually happened is to study the remnants. And then what was really interesting, what we actually didn't know, is there's a separate company that's actually making the rocket to get OSIRIS-REx into space. So we got to hear a little presentation about like the science and the engineering behind those rockets that's going to get OSIRIS-REx into space so it can get to Bennu and start that mission. Now we're not going quite as fast as the sample return at 27,000 miles an hour, but when we do separate uh, the OSIRIS-REx mission, we'll be going 22,000 miles an hour which is faster, 15 times faster than uh, a fighter jet. And for our gentleman from the Bronx, it, it could take you from uh, the Bronx to L.A. in uh, 6.7 minutes. Can you make the launch tonight? Yeah, so, <laughs> see if I can get you by. That's right. And I was actually lucky enough to be able to ask a question about how Newton's first law fits into all of this because there's no friction in space, so if you sent something off in space, it would just keep moving forever. And I was lucky enough to be able to ask a question about that. And it's just so amazing that these people took time out of their day to be able to talk to us, a few vloggers on YouTube, who were there and able to learn so much about the OSIRIS-REx mission. Okay, so um, I just did a video on Newton's first law of motion. And I wanted to know, um, a while ago I talked to Dr. Alan Stern, and he worked on the New Horizons mission. And it really amazed me that most of the New Horizons mission, the spacecraft was dormant. And it was just using inertia to fly, there was no um, motors, no nothing, it was just going. So I wanted to know um, how much of the actual mission is inertia, as well as there was a lot of stress on the New Horizons mission because it was dormant and then it just turned back on. There was one day where it had to turn back on. Um, do you think it's going to be the same kind of thing, the same kind of stress with like the cameras turning on and stuff like that? So, so we're a little bit different than New Horizons in terms of it took a really long time to get to Pluto. 
So um, we are the same in terms of how often we fire our different engines and motors. So once we launch and we come off the Centaur, right, we'll be going on inertial until we come back by Earth and then we do another burn, right? We have some correction burns that we have op opportunities to, but really we launch, we come by Earth, we do a burn when we come by Earth. When we get closer to the asteroid, we have to do another burn in order to make sure that we intersect with where the asteroid's going to be. And so that's our second. And then our third is when we leave to come home. Um, and then, um, we, again, we have some small corrections that happen, but the rest of the time, we're inertial. Now, we're actually powered and in communication throughout, so we aren't going into hibernation like New Horizons did. Um, we'll be able to talk to it. I believe that we have about once monthly contact plan. Um, uh, and, and then when we're in um, different phases, we'll have much more than that in terms of communication. So once we launch, we kind of stay on um, and get to talk and do interesting things until we get to the asteroid even. Thank you. And just to add to that a little bit, the, the, the real challenge comes when we're around Bennu and we won't be inertial for those operations where Rich talked about the different kinds of thrusters that we have on the spacecraft, from very tiny thrusters up to the big main engines. Around Bennu, we're constantly changing our inertia because we've got to change how we're looking at the asteroid. So we move around quite a bit. It doesn't take a lot of thrust. It takes a very tiny thrust. But that can even be more challenging because trying to control a very, very tiny amount of thrust uh, is maybe more difficult than a giant burn on the main engine. So once, unlike the New Horizons, which just was by Pluto, get as much data as you could and keep going. We're gonna stop and we're gonna keep moving around and getting different looks and views and angles uh, on the asteroid. And so there'll be a lot of changes to the inertial state of the spacecraft during that part of the mission. I also got to see the actual OSIRIS-REx spacecraft, which was absolutely crazy. You could see the return capsule, you could see everything, and you could just see the whole actual spacecraft there. There are a bunch of people down there that I got to do like a little bit of a Q&A with, but it was absolutely crazy that I am standing behind a glass wall, that if I just the glass wall wasn't there, I would be able to run up and touch OSIRIS-REx. That thing is going all the way into space and touching an asteroid, and I just saw that with my own eyes, and I'm one of the only people that's actually going to be able to see that, which is absolutely crazy that I was able to see it while it was being worked on. So we're in front of Osiris Rex right now, and I'm really excited. Um, it's right in front of me. That thing right in front of me is going to Bennu, and it's such an amazing, an amazing opportunity just to be standing like right in front of it. And just right there, you can see everything. So cool. Return capsule. It's just so cool that I like tag time in the return capsule because those are what the like most, almost one of the most important things is to get the sample and put it back. Um, and I really like them. And the sample return capsule kind of looks like a coffee cake. The first thing I want to talk about is the uh, TAGSAM head itself. And so this is kind of the business end of the uh, sampling for the mission. TAGSAM stands for the Touch and Go Sample Acquisition Mechanism. Um, you may have heard uh, that the genesis for this started in the driveway of one of our engineers about 10 years ago. Uh, we were thinking about how you might collect material in a microgravity environment on a comet or an asteroid. And, well, maybe you could use some pressurized gas to mobilize the material and, and collect it. And so he used a uh, little air hose and uh, some pressurized air and a cup and did some proof of demonstration with a gravel in his driveway. And uh, here we are, well, it's over 10 years. It's now close to 12 years later and uh, we have TAGSAM. So again, this is not the flight TAGSAM, but this is uh, nearly flight, nearly the same as the flight model on the spacecraft that you saw earlier today. They also have a mascot, which was really interesting, which is a penguin in a dinosaur suit, which also happened to be in a clean room suit at the time, which was absolutely crazy that they have a mascot. They have, and it has a Twitter account, which is Penrex, and it was really cool to see that and kind of learn a little bit about Penrex, and he's really cool, and I will be a link in the description where you can check out his Twitter account. So they also have a little penguin, which I just asked about, and it's really cool. Um, they, it's basically their mascot, and he kind of goes, and he looks at all like the different facilities where the parts are being made I mean, and stuff yeah, like that, and you can't tell right now, but he's actually a penguin in a dinosaur suit, which is kind of like Osiris Rex, and like Rex is the whole dinosaur thing. 
Then we got to go to the operations control room, which was really interesting because it's not at all what you see in movies. What you see in movies is like these big screens and thousands of buttons anywhere, and if you press one button, then the entire spacecraft would hurtle into the sun and then everything would go wrong and then you just broke the entire universe. No, it's not like that. It basically just looks like an office building with a bunch of cubicles in it. But they did have a lot of really cool models there, which was really, really nice, which I don't think you would see in a normal office building. But yeah, it just looks like a normal office building with a few signs. That's just what the mission control room looked like. Some spacecraft, they talk daily through the deep space network, and we get their data on a regular basis. Other spacecraft will go maybe a week, maybe even two in between contacts, uh, if it's during cruise offs. OSIRIS is very similar. We launch, we'll have continuous DSN coverage for a number of days. And we'll sort of trail off to three tracks a week until we get to the asteroid, when then we'll of course have an increase in coverage and be more day-to-day -day activities, a lot more people on console. Then we got to go to the test lab, which was really, really cool. And they actually built a giant asteroid wall, which was what they guessed the surface of the asteroid Bennu was going to be like. So they kind of guessed and kind of mapped it out and put boulders and all sorts of really crazy rocks and stuff like that. And they just had this giant asteroid wall there. So they can test, like, the return sample. The little arm can go in and test and gra try and grab stuff from that asteroid wall to make sure that it's working properly and that it will suck up all the stuff properly and that in case if slightly off at angled, you would be able to get a lot of that. And it was really, really cool to see they literally built just a giant asteroid wall, which I'm still amazed that they did. So this would be in our testing for OSIRIS-REx, that would be OSIRIS-REx. Now it doesn't look like a spacecraft at all, but that's because we're, a, we're in a gravity environment. So we have to overcome gravity to be able to move the vehicle at the rates and uh, accelerations that a vehicle would move in space without gravity. So it can move a lot easier in space but and, and on Earth, it's a lot harder. So we have to have a big motors and stuff to move at the same precision that the spacecraft is designed to do. They also had a mock International Space Station, which was really cool. So they can practice docking spacecrafts up on an International Space Station, which was really, really crazy. As well as they had a Habitat, which is basically a prototype of stuff they will send to a manned mission to Mars, which is really crazy. They had a fake one there. We almost got to walk into it, but we didn't quite have time. But it was really crazy. It had like a sign on the thing that actually like guesstimated the rations that someone would need. This is how much water, this is how much food and they had space, they had like a tiny pet treadmill, they had beds, they had all sorts of really crazy stuff and it was just really amazing to be able to look at this habitat that someone designed for people to actually go up and go to Mars. And what we really need to do to get humans to Mars is we need to significantly increase both distance and duration. And we do that, uh, and the idea is to actually use something like this, a cislunar habitat, uh, in a place that NASA calls the Proving Grounds, which is an area where we'll test the procedures, the technology, and really gain the know-how that astronauts will need to have in order to operate more autonomously. For example, on board the International Space Station, it takes at least or roughly a thousand commands from the ground a day. That was pretty much the end of our day. We got to take a big group picture in front of the asteroid wall and I got to sit on someone's shoulders, but it was really crazy and uh, just to have the experience of going all the way there and seeing the actual spacecraft and learning so much. But it was really nice to meet all these other YouTubers and social media people and scientists. And there was such a wide variety of people that did all sorts of different things. And it was just really crazy to be able to see them all and meet all sorts of really crazy people that I would really love to be able to have collabs with and stuff like that in the future. If you watch my other channel, Acto Games, you know that I travel a lot and I go to a lot of conventions and I collect badges. And I can definitely say that this one right here is definitely one of my favorites. It looks amazing. Like, they have a really good graphics designer. Kudos to whoever this graphic designer is because it looks amazing. And I'm just so proud to be able to have gone to a NASA social event and gotten a badge from it. I have even a lanyard, which I will probably use for very many different cons. And it's just so crazy that I was able to go out there and do a NASA social event event and have a badge to prove it and have the opportunity to go and learn so much. It was absolutely crazy and a huge thank you to the NASA social people for letting me go out. Please subscribe to this channel if you want more content. We do a lot of really cool science stuff and we hope that you guys will stay around. Thank you for watching and hopefully I'll see you next time.